With the balance of power swinging every day in the Allies' favor, 1945 opened with the Japanese forced into desperately defensive tactics. But their air force maintained a constant attack on our ships in a vain effort to restrain the mounting tempo of the Allied advance northward up through the Pacific. In addition to the Allied strafing of the enemy-occupied territories, the Japanese resorted to a scorched earth policy. By mid-year, Borneo was on the horizon, but under a pall of smoke, the rich oil fields were blazing infernos, not to be completely subdued until more than three months later. The operations to recapture Tarakan and Balakpapan were the most complex amphibious assaults ever carried out in the final stages of the Pacific War, and Australia was making a larger contribution to fighting formations than America or the United Kingdom. A remarkable effort which could not have been achieved without the support of those on the home front. And on the home front, land army girls, more than 3,000 of them in the eastern states alone, took to the fields to step up the production of crops and vegetables, releasing manpower for the services. For the first time, it was a shooting war for the supposedly weaker sex. On the rifle ranges, when the sailors came ashore for small arms training, it was the rams manning the butts, checking scores and operating the targets. They even maintained the weapons, a far cry from oiling a typewriter. And there were the weather waps, the girls of the Air Force who played vital roles at the many meteorological stations scattered around the continent. They were responsible for the hydrogen balloons carrying tiny two-pound radio transmitters. Into the stratosphere they soared, sending back data which governed the flight plans of our restricted civil aircraft and those of the RAAF. The Mosquito fighter bombers based at Northern Australian airfields and proving their worth on photo reconnaissance over the Netherlands East Indies. 400 miles an hour wooden insects powered by the famous Merlin engines, they were coming out of Australian factories but with a slight difference. Canadian birchwood was unavailable, so Australian coachwood was substituted to build the fuselage. This type was used by the RAAF, particularly in survey work, for over five years. And from America came the Liberators, to be manned by Australians. Squadrons of them whose weapons comprised bombs, guns and cameras. And which, with their long range, became more and more effective as the Japanese were slowly but surely driven back from the shores they'd invaded. In the munition factories, working around the clock, production was at a record rate. Deadly sea mines were coming off the assembly lines to meet the increasing demands of the mine layers. An operation requiring an army of skilled artisans who subjected their lethal handiwork to the most searching tank tests before handing them over to the Navy. And while Australians were making mines to sink ships, in Brisbane, Asians temporarily seeking refuge in Australia went to work building ships, refrigerated supply barges. Chinese, they proved eager and adequate in their work. Every launching marked their contribution in an all-out war to defeat the Japanese. But an increasing war effort demanded more and more money, and loan rallies were the order of the day. Strike me lucky Roy Reed, better known as Mo in an elephant race. Leading bookmakers were there too. Jockey Billy Cook donned his silks, but on this occasion he was interested only in winning the race for freedom, as were Mo and a host of other public figures. And attractive figures in whose headgear was reflected the lone rally trend. A sort of war bond bonnet, you might say. Styles which, yes, added a colourful touch, but hardly likely to cause any loss of sleep among the designers of the millinery industry. To add punch to the lone rally were former world heavyweight boxing champion Gene Tunney, now a commander in the American Navy. Jack Dempsey, the Manassa Mauler who took time off to study some Australiana. Nineteen years previously, 120,000 fight fans had paid just on two million dollars to see Tunney take the title from Dempsey. 
and a year later saw Dempsey fail to regain it at Chicago in the famous Long Count fight. But though the gait and the standard was a little lower, there was more speed when these two young boys met in the final of the New South Wales Amateur Featherweight Championship. It was a non-stop affair with any lack of skill and style being more than compensated for by the determination of the combatants. But it couldn't go on forever, and when White Pants managed to clip Black Pants on the button in this wild flurry, Black succumbed to the delayed action of a blackout. Having proved they could take the place of men on the land in wartime, these girls decided they could do just as good a job in the saddle. And so they displayed their prowess at a police rodeo carnival. And what a shock was in store for the spectators. The slow motion camera showed just how good these equestrians were. It was certainly a tough task facing the menfolk to put on a better show when it was their turn to battle with the Bronx. But the boys weren't in the race. They only confirmed that what goes up must come down, right down to earth. This is Sydney's Harold Park Raceway. Trotting, always a popular sport, had been forced into the background during the war years. But it was now rapidly regaining favour. Gigs, gears and silks were taken out of mothballs and the trotters and paces were at it again. To horsemen and race followers the world over, there's no more pleasing sight than that of the rhythmic gait of the harnessed racehorse. in trotting proved so strong that it wasn't long before night meetings were introduced. But no one could ever expect such an innovation at Flemington for this, the richest race on the Australian turf calendar, the Melbourne Cup. The 85th two-miler and the crowd only a few thousand short of the record attendance of 1926. Facing up for the run home, the white faces of St. Ferry and Rainburn showed up as the field overtakes the tiring leader immediate. Then Leonard slips through on the rails with St. Ferry, Silver Link and Russia. But watch the flashing white blaze of Rainbird on the outside. Getting to work with the whip, Billy Cook takes the 12 to 1 gallon South Australian mare to an easy two and a half lengths victory from Silver Link and Leonard. Three Sydney jockeys fill the places. It was Cook's second cup win, and that's how it happened. A Sydney jockey went to Melbourne to send the cup to Adelaide. This was the first new Surfboard Association carnival at Bondi, a forest of tall timber, some of the boards 18 feet long, and changed from flat solid pieces to laminated and buoyant plywood. Travelling as light as the feathery foam, a newly organised sport for a water-loving nation. And from all these operations, one of our swimmers is missing on a wave to remember. Much to the dismay of some Labour Party colleagues, Prime Minister John Curtin had announced his approval of the appointment for the first time of a royal Governor-General. And on January the 30th, Henry, Duke of Gloucester, took office as the 10th representative of the monarch in Australia. But it was young Prince William who stole the show at Government House in Canberra on the first day of his father's term of office, which was to last for two and a half years. One of the Duke's first official tasks was to open the Captain Cook Graving Dock in Sydney, a $20 million project carried out in three years by an army of more than 4,000 men working 24 hours a day. One of the largest dry docks in the world, it was built to service allied warships of any size for the final drive against Japan. A unique arrival by warship for the royal party. The artificial harbour is 1137 feet long, 152 feet wide, and 30 acres of the harbour were reclaimed to join Garden Island to Potts Point. In August 1895, 
My grandfather opened the Prince of Wales dock at Leith, the largest at that time in existence. And in July 1933, my father opened the King George V graving dock at Southampton. You can therefore understand the pleasure it now affords me to declare this great dock in Australia open for use. A dock named after the discoverer of the harbour which it graces, Captain James Cook. Although the work on the dock had been completed without a hitch, the position on the general industrial front was far from stable. Unrest among the workers was growing, demonstrations and strikes were prevalent, and by the year's end, more than 2,100,000 workdays had been lost by over 315,000 strikers seeking a 40-hour week. The situation continued until the goal was reached two years later. In America, not only industry, but the whole nation received an unexpected setback with the death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 32nd president and sixth cousin of Theodore Roosevelt. A victim of paralysis of the legs since 1921, Franklin D., who only eight weeks previously had joined with Churchill and Stalin at the famous Yalta Conference, was in his fourth term as democratic leader of the nation, a feat unparalleled by any of his predecessors. 26 days later, Germany's fast-fading struggle came to an end. Hitler had suicided, the Luftwaffe had been shot out of the skies, and the Nazi armies had been caught in the unbreakable Allied pincer grip. VE Day, victory in Europe. To Field Marshal Lord Montgomery, hero of the Western Deserts, who had outfoxed Rommel and his panzer divisions, fell the honor of presiding at the surrender. The Third Reich was no more. While the surviving German leaders were silently signing this historic document, Bedlam was let loose across the Channel in England. No more fervent demonstration was staged than that outside Buckingham Palace, which reached a crescendo when the royal family appeared on the balcony with Winston Churchill. historic occasion marking the pinnacle of his career for the nation's inspiring wartime leader. But eight weeks later, it was Australia's turn to mourn. After nearly four years as Prime Minister, John Curtin died in Canberra at the age of 60. This son of an Irish policeman was in his tenth year as national head of the Australian Labour Party. A record for length of term and surely for the historic events that were crowded into it. Though his health suffered through the anxieties of the time, his last three years of activity had established his leadership. The nation mourned for the person whom Churchill described as the most commanding, competent and wholehearted leader of the Australian people. John Curtin, whose last journey was from Canberra to Karakutta Cemetery near his home in Perth. Less than a fortnight later, Joseph Benedict Chifley was elevated from Federal Treasurer to the Prime Ministership, a position which he was to hold until the Menzies government was returned to power in 1949. Chip, the man who mounted the first rung of the political ladder as an engine driver from Bathurst. With the nation already anticipating the early end of the conflict on this side of the world, the arrival of units of the British Navy in Sydney Harbour inspired even greater confidence, if that were possible at this stage, in the result of the final effort to crush the Japanese. And it was fitting that the flagship of the British fleet, HMS Illustrious, was to be the first ship to use the recently completed Captain Cook graving dock. Brisbane, however, attention was focused on the departure of a ship. It was a case of here comes the bride, or at least here go the brides, Australian-born girls who'd selected husbands from among the million or so American servicemen who'd passed through Australia on the way to war in the previous two or three years. 
And now it was time for the very young Aussie Americans to meet their fathers in a new country on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. But fortunately, not all our fair damsels were lured away. In a dress rehearsal at Manly Beach for a surf carnival interlude, 25 Miss Australia entrants boarded a duck from HMS Implacable. They set off in the general direction of America, but after all, were hardly equipped for the trip. It wasn't until the girls saw this film from a motionless seat in a cinema days later that they realized just how close to disaster they'd sailed in their steel motorized surfboat. They uh, lost the battle with the surf, but their ducking on a duck didn't dampen their efforts to support the war veterans' appeal. And at a Comforts Fund appeal, a jitterbug jamboree as bugs cut a rug with a rhythmic hug. Crowds packed the open-air auditorium to watch exhibitions of the prevailing dance craze jitterbugging, introduced by American servicemen. Watch this pair go through their hair-raising routine. Hardly suitable for a ballroom, but ideal entertainment for the beachfront audience. On another stage in Sydney, visiting Lancashire sweetheart of the servicemen held the spotlight. Gracie Fields. that landed on a desert island, not a soul in sight. Suddenly a little colored girl came up from nowhere. She says, ah, really, sailor? You like a big steak? He says, what, you got a big steak here? That's marvelous, he says, I'm starving. <laughs> he had the steak, they said, you like some beer? He says, this isn't, this is not true. She says, yes, I have some beer. He says, pass it on, pass it on. <laughs> and she came along, she says, like a cigarette? He says, blimey, he says, pass it on, pass it on. <laughs> And she says, you like to come out in the wood and play games? She says, blimey, have they got a dark board here? <laughs> I'm a little on the lonely, a little on the lonely side. I keep thinking of your money. And wishing you were by my side You know, my dear, when you're not here There's no one to romance with So if I'm found with someone new It's just someone to dance with Every letter that you send me I read a dozen times or more any wonder that I love you more and more Oh, how I miss your tender kiss And long to hold you tight I'm a little on the lonely side tonight and enticed her on his yacht. <laughs> then he got her tied up in a proper sailor's knot. <laughs> then he kissed her twice, the dirty dog, upon her beauty spot. Oh, I never cried so much in all my life. <laughs> she lingered near the rose and crown. The wind was howling wild. When up the village street there came the father of her child. She wasn't married. <laughs> performance by the most popular entertainer to visit Australia in 1945.
On August the 15th, hostilities with Japan ceased. But there was a campaign still not finalized. The relief and repatriation of thousands of POWs rotting in Japanese hell camps. To the RAAF fell the task of seeking them out. First they located and pinpointed the jungle camps and then the biscuit bombers took over. Most urgent requirements were medical supplies and these and food packages were dropped in 200 pound torpedoes as these life-giving bombs were labeled. It was weeks in some cases before land parties could make their way to the jungle jails, there to see at first hand the pitiful conditions under which the POWs had existed. Old bathtubs were top class cooking utensils in which to prepare the meals of roots, weeds, rice, when it could be scrounged or stolen, and perhaps garnished with a little shredded coconut. And though their weight dropped, the boys' morale never wavered. They even fashioned their own musical instruments, anything from a guitar to a bull fiddle. This table was no cabinet maker's masterpiece, but worth its weight in gold. Its legs contained a secret radio. A strict schedule of camp duties was maintained in an effort to keep their quarters as clean as possible. But these brooms were used mainly to sweep the air for radio news bulletins broadcast from Australia. Screwdrivers suddenly became tuning knobs. A tube from a doctor's stethoscope made an easily concealed but highly effective headpiece. Came the great moment in the lives of these survivors of the ill-fated 8th Division. They were on their way home. Some able to walk unaided, many stretcher cases. And before this mercy mission was completed, no fewer than 13,872 servicemen and civilians were repatriated from prison camps scattered from Changi in Singapore up to Japan itself. had miraculously survived a tour of duty on the building of the Burma Railway when the Japanese mercilessly whipped them along a 200-mile stretch through rugged, disease-infested country. Of an estimated workforce of 61,000 Allied prisoners, more than 12,000 died on the job, 2,800 of them Australians. After completion of the railway in October 1943, another 5,200 Australian POWs were to die at the hands of the Japanese. So the scene was set in Tokyo Bay aboard the American battle cruiser Missouri, the 2nd of September, almost four years after the day of infamy when the United States Pacific Fleet was dealt a crushing blow at Pearl Harbor. General Douglas MacArthur had fulfilled his promise and had returned, together with his top line officers of the Allied forces, to accept the surrender of the enemy. Australia's first and only Field Marshal Sir Thomas Blamey was there, while HMAS Shropshire had brought Commander Collins. The most humiliating moment for the Emperor's leaders as they sign. The proudest for General MacArthur as he put his name to the historic document, handed the pen to General Wainwright, and World War II was officially over. Within minutes, Britain's new Prime Minister Clement Attlee broadcast to the world, Japan has today surrendered and the last of our enemies is laid low. Peace has once more come to the world. Let us thank God for his great deliverance and his mercies. Long live the King. An announcement which triggered off an explosion of pent-up emotions around Australia. In hamlets and towns, particularly in the capital cities, amazing scenes were witnessed unparalleled before or since. They yelled, they laughed, they cried and they danced. For those who took part in this joyous celebration, it was an experience never to be forgotten.
Queensland could take exception to the antics of this character who exemplified the feelings of all Australians on this August day of 1945. A year to remember.